Welcome, everyone. It's a wrap with rap. I am your host, Ron Rappaport. This podcast features people who have overcome life's challenges and adversities, people who can inspire and motivate, and people who can educate us on an assortment of topics. My guest today is my sister in arms against breast cancer, Carrie Madrid from Riverside, California. In 2012, at the age of 41, Carrie was diagnosed with stage three infiltrating ductal carcinoma of the breast. Carrie endured a mastectomy, chemotherapy, radiation, and reconstructive surgery. As a divorced mother of three children, Carrie struggled financially and emotionally throughout her cancer extravaganza and got to know other patients going through similar struggles. Committed to positivity and a strong belief that she could be a role model for others faced with a life-threatening diagnosis, laughter and lip gloss became her model. Barely out of treatment herself, Carrie decided she needed to create a nonprofit to assist both male and female breast cancer patients financially and emotionally, and incorporated the Care Project, Inc. in 2013. Cancer transformed Carrie's mindset and ultimately gave her newfound passion and appreciation for life and making a difference. She is now speaking to high school and college age young adults, sharing her experience of trauma and tragedy turned into purpose. Carrie shares how you can be resilient in spite of it all. Welcome, Carrie, to the podcast. So glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So Carrie, tell us about your life prior to 2012. You wrote that before cancer, you were merely surviving and now you are thriving. What did you mean by that? Yeah, I, I, well, let me tell you how I came to that conclusion. First of all, um, I was asked to speak to a group of college kids at their annual conference at UC Riverside. And I had never been a keynote speaker in my life. I'm not a public speaker. I'm not even a college graduate. And I thought, who and why are these people asking me to speak at their event, right? And right. so in order to try to prepare for it, I was like, okay, what am I going to say? What lessons, what nuggets of wisdom can I give them? So what I did was sort of an exercise in that I took myself to Dallas for a weekend. I sat in a little one bedroom apartment in an Airbnb and I started writing out on my laptop um, from my earliest childhood memories up until my cancer diagnosis. And I just thought, I don't know where this is going to go, but, you know, kind of the life defining moments and things that have, you know, stuck with me yeah. all these years. Sure. And there was a lot of things. So my parents grew up and, and they both were raised, born and raised in San Francisco, met in high school, 15 and 18 years old, got married young, had my brother and I, and they divorced uh, when I was about five. And so that kind of changed the trajectory of my life as most kids have divorced, right? Sure. So my brother went to live with my father after a time. I went with my mom. Eventually my mom remarries, has a set of twins, my little brothers who I adore when I was eight. And that kind of changed my life a bit, right? And a then lot of changes at an early age, yeah. A lot of changes at an early age. And then we relocated 500 miles away from the Bay Area to Southern California when my stepdad got a new job. So what that did was sort of really disrupt the obvious visitation with my father and my older brother. And right. um, it set me in a new world that was completely different from Northern California. Anyone that's been in California for any amount of time knows that it might as well be two different states. Yeah. So different between the Bay Area and Southern California. And they both have their great qualities, but it is a different life. Right. So as I was writing these things down, it started with the divorce and certain things that left me feeling a certain kind of way, right? Feeling like I didn't fit in at dad's house because it was such a different environment. Feeling like I didn't belong in my mom's house any longer because now the focus was on the twins. And you know, now that I'm 50 years old and I look back, I realize, you know, that everybody did the best that they could, right. but it left me feeling sort of, just sort of floating there, feeling like I didn't fit in either place, right? And so- yeah. Understandable. Yeah. So there was that. And then as I kept writing, there was instances of bullying, like in junior high school, right? And always being asked back then, what are you? What's your ethnicity? You know, the Mexican kids would ask me, are you Mexican? Your last name's Madrid. No, I'm not. Okay, well, what are you? You know, and my mom is like, 
blonde and, and she's Italian, but she's blonde and super fair skin. My dad was not, he was Spanish and Portuguese and a host of other stuff. So there was that big ethnic thing. Like, where do you fit in? Because when I was growing up while we were, I was in a very diverse, um, situation and Southern California is really a melting pot, right? Sure. But still within the schools, there's those clicks yeah. and I didn't quite fit in to any of them. Right. Right. So there was that again, reinforcing you don't fit in. So yeah. just a lot of stuff. I didn't get along really well with my stepdad and, you know, he did his best, but there was just a disconnect there for us to the point where I ended up moving out of my house before I even graduated high school. So fast forward, I end up making some poor decisions, becoming a teenage mother. I had my son when I was a senior in high school. Okay. So imagine how dad took that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so a lot of things that some were um, poor choices, some were just circumstances out of my control, but very long story short, what I've realized in prepping for that talk that I gave is there was all these things and that were either said to me, done around me, or um, just directly affected me in some way that conditioned me to believe I wasn't good enough, I wasn't smart enough, I didn't fit in. So it it caused me to form this bubble around myself, a force field, if you will, to really yeah. just shelter myself from being further hurt, further rejected, further disappointed, any of those things. And so, you know, I went on to get married very young. I had two more kids and then eventually ended up divorced because we were just entirely too young to get married at 21. And, you know, unfortunately I grew up and he didn't, and he was a fantastic father, uh, but he was a horrible husband, you yeah. know, and oh, yeah. uh, just repeated, you know, infidelities and all that. And eventually I just woke up and went enough is enough. That's it. But even with that, it reinforced, okay, I wasn't good enough. How come I couldn't make him appreciate what he had? You know, that, that whole thing. Yeah. If you fast forward to right before my diagnosis, I was a single mom, like you noted, I was working two jobs for over nine years. I was um, grinding and working hard and getting the bills paid. And in my kids' words, I was um, an amazing provider. And I always made a way and I did have help from my dad along the way, you know, when, when Anthony's feet were growing like crazy and he was going through, you know, three different sizes of shoes in a year, my dad would be like, don't worry about it. I got it. You yeah, know? Yeah. Uh, so I had help, you know, from family, but, but it was taught, it was tough. And so eventually, um, right when I quit that second job and I kind of just thought, okay, let me adjust my life and, and we'll make it work. We moved to a cheaper apartment, all that good stuff. I was walking around a local mountain, getting my exercise in, and I kind of was talking to my creator saying, hey, what am I supposed to do with the last half of my life? Like, there's got to be more to life than just surviving as right. a single mom. There's got to be more to life. And, and I'm the type that I need to feel like what I do is making a difference. You know, I've yeah. worked the same job in a meta, a cat, for a catastrophic case management company for 20, almost 22 years now. So it's been a great job. It's been great stability for me to provide for my kids. And I feel like I'm making a difference within the company, but I know that in the end, I'm just a number in a corporation and I needed more, you know? So I had volunteered at the high school, helping run the girls basketball program as their booster president for six years, I think. Um, and at that point, I just was, like I said, walking around the mountain going, what am I supposed to do with the last half of my life? I can't be that creepy adult at the high school, even after my kids are gone. Right. 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 You wanted, you needed some, some purpose. I needed some purpose. And yeah, Ron, yeah. I rolled over in bed two weeks later and found two tumors. And I was like, okay, God, that is not what I had in mind, you know, but uh, sometimes uh, God sends signals. Man. Signals. Right. Yeah. 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 So, Carrie, Carrie, how did you react to the diagnosis? You know, it's, it's, it's sounds like a load of crap, but to be brutally honest with you, I had a total peace about it. And I don't say that as a yay me. I say that as a, oh my gosh, there really is a divine purpose in this. I, I in no way, shape or form wasn't scared. I was definitely scared. Yeah. 
Um, I was definitely, I think, in shock. But at the same time, I just had a total peace about it. And I remember my best friend Lupe was with me at the time when the surgeon came in and said, oh, honey, you know, I found two tumors. So one was invasive or infiltrating ductal. The other was DCIS, very different areas, same breast. And they just explained to me, this is systemic. This is serious. This is large. We got we to gotta go in right away. And I remember her looking at me and she just said, how can you be so effing calm? And I said, you know what? I have 32 basketball daughters watching me and my own two and my son. And maybe, just maybe, this is like a responsibility given to me to show others how to deal with it. I don't know, but I, I, it's okay. And I just kept saying to her, it's okay. And she was like, yeah, this is not okay. And we cussed a little, but you know, other than yeah. that, I, I really did have a piece about it. Okay. I think that's, that, that sounds really uh, kind of like I felt, you know, when I got my diagnosis too. Did you? Yeah. Um, tell us about the treatment that you received and, and did you have any emotional support going, getting through it? Yeah. So I, the day that I got those results, it, the decision was made right then we have to have, you know, the doctor says we have to do a mastectomy. There's no way around it. I'm like, yeah. fine, take them both, take them both. He said, no, I'm not going to take them both because you're young, you're going to have reconstruction. Um, and I'm just the general surgeon. I'm there to cut the cancer out. A plastic surgeon will make it real pretty. So how about we do a single mastectomy now, you get through your treatment, then when you're ready for reconstruction, they can take the other if you still want it. And I said, okay, that's fine. So 10 days later, I had a single mastectomy. Then I had um, uh, chemo radiation. My mastectomy, my dad flew down. He was still alive. He flew down from the Bay Area, um, even though I begged him not to. He was like, I got to be there. And I was like, seriously, I'm getting a boob cut off, dad. You want to be there? He's like, <laughs> uh, yeah. And I'm like, how about you come down for chemo? <laughs> you know, like. Hey, dads, dads are dads, you know. Yeah, I know, I know. But I just thought, oh, man. So my dad flew down. My mom was there. Luckily, they were friends. So my mom and dad were there. I was dating somebody at the time that was getting pretty serious. So he was there. Um, I sent my kids to school, it, you know, business as usual. The girls yeah. were, one was in junior high, one was in high school. My son was in Korea serving in the Air Force and he had just got there. So he couldn't come home yet. My doctors were working to get him back to the States. But I had um, my parents for my surgery and my beloved Dr. Martin, who is, uh, was a fellow basketball mom and is one of my best friends and my primary care physician. So she really kind of orchestrated my care. Um, when I came home from surgery, my mom was kind of there to, you know, do laundry and go get groceries. And my dad just was there, like, give me a bill to pay, give me something to do, you know, like dads do. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, uh, once I got through that, um, chemo started, my son was able to get home from the States. Um, he and my mom took me to my first chemo treatment, which I think was the scariest part of everything, right? Because you don't know. You just know, you see all those bad lifetime movies of everyone's puking their guts up and they lose all this weight. And, um, yeah. but I had my son for the first chemo and each, I had six chemo treatments, um, all three drugs at once, uh, six times every three weeks. So each time I had uh, one person with me. So either my mom, my son, a friend. Um, but they would basically take me to chemo, bring me home, make sure I was okay. And then I'd go, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. And I'd send them home. And I probably never should have done that, but I did. Did you maintain uh, income from your job going through the treatments? I did because I work from home and I have for 20 years. Um, I actually only took six days off for my mastectomy and my HR lady and my boss was like, are you nuts? And I was like, look, I got a kid going to prom soon. I got one in basketball. I can't afford to live on disability. And so my lovely employer said, you know what? That's fine if you want to work, but here's what we're going to do. Your coworkers are going to absorb 80% of your caseload. So you're still going to get paid 40 hours a week, but we're going to give you a lot less work. And that was the best thing because during chemo, I couldn't see straight. Yeah, and that's I, awesome of your employer to do oh, that. Oh, they're, they've been amazing. They have been amazing. So I'm very loyal to them because they have been to me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Tell but us I what. I incurred a lot of expenses though. You know, I should interject that. While I kept my income, remember I was a single mom. So I lived check yeah. to check. 
So now you've got all these, you know, all the copays from all the office visits, from the medication that you've got to, you know, pre-medicate oh, sure. before chemo and after. And so all those things added up and I incurred a lot of credit card debt, but I look at it like, thank God I had the credit available. Yeah. My dad did help me to pay those off. And I realize there's a lot of people that don't have that option. Yes. Yeah. Tell us what you observed uh, from making friends of others going through the cancer journey uh, in terms of financial and emotional issues affecting them. You know what I found interesting? Um, I'm going to speak about the emotional first because the the person I was dating I thought he was going to be there, but the day after my mastectomy, when I came home, which happened to be Valentine's day, by the way, oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, jokes on me. Uh, he decided he kind of couldn't handle it anymore. So he bolted and, and that's okay. It was a, it was a blessing in disguise, but it was a blow, um, feeding into you're not good enough. You know, that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Going into that scenario and uh, going back there. Yeah. So, um, but I had a job to do. And so I stayed focused on taking care of me and what I needed to do. Sure. But emotionally, what, what I found perplexing at the time was I would be in the chemo suite, right. Where there's like 20 chairs lined up and there's all these people having their chemo and, and uh, there would be uh, a lot of spouses there and just doting on their, their person. Right. Right. And here I was like by myself, you know, and I might have a friend, but I was just like, oh, you know, it's not the same. Right. And so I would see them sort of falling apart and I would hear them in like online, um, like Facebook groups. Right. And they, in particular, I'm in, in a group that's all female and they would be in there sort of just really, um, expressing, how distraught they were and how sad and how scared and how terrible it was and their husband, this and their husband, that, and their partner, this and their partner, that And I was sitting there thinking to myself, I was being all judgmental. Right. And I was sitting there thinking, you're lucky you have somebody. I don't have anybody. And why am I not falling apart? Why are they falling apart? I was all judgy. Right. Well, you, he, you, you were, you were tough. You had to be tough. I had to. And so this yeah. is what I, this is no what choice. I found. This is what I found in, in retrospect, right? So I have an ex-boyfriend who's a, still a very good friend of mine, lives out of state, and he knew I was going through this. So he called me up and he said, hey, I'm going to be in town this weekend. I know you're having your chemo. Can you let me take you? I want to take you. Let me just take care of you because I know you're probably over there trying to act all badass and you're not <laughs> letting anybody help you and I'll come cut your grass and whatever needs to be done. And I was like, whatever. Okay, come on. You know, and so- Guess who was a hot blubbering mess that weekend? Me. Because uh, I could be. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So man, lesson learned. So th that's what I found emotionally that a lot of people um, just really, even though they have all these people around you, right? Even though You're you right. have all these people around you, you can still feel very lonely and afraid because all those people mean well, but if they haven't been there and done that, they just don't get it. Well, and you had that, to... you had that inner peace too. I did, you know, I d yeah, sure. And, and that inner peace, you know, got me through a lot. Yeah. You know, especially, yeah, for sure. especially when they carted me into that operating room. Yeah. And you're all by yourself, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. There's nobody else there. So you got that's the man I... above. That's about yeah. it. Yeah. But so. yeah, exactly. And, and I will say that financially, what I noticed is there was a lot of people that were saying, well, I'm not going to have treatment this week after all. And I would think, oh, why is it because your blood counts are low and your immune system is too compromised? And they'd say, no, it's $150 copay for chemo and I need to buy groceries. Yeah. So I noticed that people were choosing between the everyday necessities yeah. or having their treatment. And as a mom, I know because I had athletes, they eat a lot, right? And there's only so much spaghetti you can feed them, right? Yeah. You got to give them other stuff. And so I just thought, oh my gosh, nobody should have to choose that. Cause yeah, like that's I said, a, that's, that's heartbreaking to hear. It is heartbreaking to hear. And you know, someone not sending their kid to prom yeah, because they can't afford to go buy that dress or they physically cannot get up and go to the mall or wherever to, to right. help them pick out a dress. Right. So that, that just crushed me. Carrie, what prompted you to start the uh, care project and, how did you accomplish that task with no prior knowledge of nonprofits? Well, I had a tiny bit of knowledge in that when I was the booster president for the girls basketball program at North High School, I was 
desperately trying to raise money for them. This is the downtown school with very little funding and the, the kids, parents often couldn't afford uniforms. So I did a lot of fundraising and I did some research and realized that if I started a 501c3 for them, I might be able to get some grants or at least some sponsorship. And so I had formed the Lady Huskies Incorporated for them while I was in chemo. Who wow. am I? What a nut job. I had no business doing that. I had no idea what I was doing, but I used legal zoom. I got it done and we raised some money. And so I had just that little nugget, Yeah. but I just knew that something had to be done based on what I just shared with you about the stories I was hearing. So I just talked to my friend, Christina, who is also, uh, was also a single mom at the time with four daughters. So you know, we both work hard and had little side hustles and just decided like, if anyone can help people find a way to pay bills, it's us, you know? Yeah. And she just looked at me like I was nuts. And I was like, can you be my co-founder? She goes, what does that mean? I said, I don't know, just come along <laughs> and, and just help sign me. The so, papers. <laughs> yeah, sign the papers. And, and you know what? My family has been incredible because they looked at me like, okay, if this is going to get her out of the basketball gym and give her something to do, um, cause this was a year I actually started it in 2013. So I was still like in treatment, Yeah. but it was kind of a natural organic thing. But I think I've shared with you before, like for me, it was just a passion project. Like, Oh, I'm going to help people. I had right. no idea. I was like starting a full on business, Yeah. but my community, my family got behind me. They funded it for the first year. We didn't have an office or anything. So no overhead, right. you know, we volunteer yeah. and I'm able to, my boss is so supportive. He's actually donated. He knows what I do. And um, it just, I think it's just, I always tell people, if you have something that's really heavy on your heart, like I really need to do this and I have no clue how or why, and yeah, God, I really don't want to do that. If you put one foot in front of the other, and if it's meant to be, every door opens for you. And it might yeah. not be pretty. It might not be easy, but shit gets done. Well, as they say, sometimes you got to listen to the universe, right? The universe is sending you signs. Oh my gosh, Ron, I tell the story. It's like, sometimes I get these big, bright ideas, right? And I feel like I get this little tap on my shoulder, like, hey, you, you know, that thing you've been thinking about, you should go do that. And I go, yeah, who am I to do that? Right? The old tape. Who am I to do that? I can't do that. I'm not smart enough. I'm not college educated. I'm not going to do that. Then I get popped upside the head, like, hey, didn't I tell you to go do that? And I'm <laughs> like, right. hey, God, come on, man, <laughs> you know, settle down. And yeah. then something something knocks me to my knees. And if yeah. it's a crisis that I go through or a crisis someone I love goes through, and then I'm like, all right, I got it. I'm, I'm going, oh, okay. I don't know what I'm doing, but here I go. You got to be positive. You do. Carrie, tell us about what the CARE Project initially accomplished in the early going, just yeah. the early going. Well, in the very beginning, you know, we were able to get a, a small footprint here in our community and really the focus was solely on the financial aspect. So it was about gathering gift cards from, from people that wanted to donate, you know, Target gift cards, Walmart, grocery gift cards, fuel cards, whatever could help with, you know, what I always say is the everyday necessities that become luxuries when you're not working full time. What I noticed too, is we had a lot of very young patients with babies. So they were still buying diapers and formula and wipes and all that stuff. That's so yeah. extra. And so that was initially what we were, what our goal was to do. And that's what we thought we were only going to do, but it kind of morphed. Well, now that you mentioned the financial things that you did, uh, tell us about the emotional support that, that your organization offers. Yeah. So I realized the more I took phone calls and started speaking to people about their financial needs and mailing them out gift cards, or I'd meet them in the park. I mean, you think I was a drug dealer meeting them for the groceries <laughs> here, go get some groceries, you know, but what I realized is that I would spend an hour on the phone with a patient, just talking to them, letting them vent, and then kind of being able to just say, you know, I hear you and, and I get it, but try to consider this or, you know, kind of try to give them some perspective. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, I'm good at that. And I don't know where it comes from, but I think it's my keep it real approach. Like I'm going to love on you, but I'm going to keep it real. Yeah. Right. So we can get down on the mud and we can cry together and we can complain and we can do all that for a minute, but now we got to get up and dust ourselves off and keep moving. And I found that I was able to, um, I think provide 
sort of some comfort, but more so even safety. Like they saw I had already been there, done that, and I was still in the crux of it and going through more treatments and, you know, I still had reconstruction to go. And so I realized the power of talking with someone who's in the trenches with you. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So it became like, okay, now I need to meet other survivors that can act as mentors so that when these newly diagnosed people call me, I can kind of link them up if they're around the same age, if they're both single moms, if they're both religious, whatever that case may be. Right. Right. And so it started with the mentorship program. And then I also realized that I didn't want to do a support group so to speak, because you know me, you know me, Ron, I'm a badass <laughs> chick, right? I don't need to sit around and cry. And that you was are. my, <laughs> that was my thought of what a support group is, right? That was all I saw on TV. What I needed was to socialize with others that got it, where you could sit around and shoot it and just, you know, complain and share resources and tips and tricks of how to manage stuff. So we started the social club. So I was like, we're not having a support group. We're going to have a social club. <laughs> so, yeah. So with all that, we used to meet in the library community room for free, and it it just became to the point where, okay, we need an office. And then eventually that happened. Tell us about who Shannon Brown was and the annual grant that you present in her name. Yeah, so Shannon was a diagnosed with breast cancer at age 34. And she sauntered into one of our very first Survivor Social Club meetings in the library. And she came in um, very quiet, kind of reserved. Uh, she, all I knew is she worked in HR. She had done some personal development classes and was kind of like a public figure on Instagram, which I wasn't even really big on Instagram then. Uh, her handle was your life is amazing. It's still there. You can, you can go to it and see it. She became like a life coach and she really was instrumental in helping me kind of get the social club set up. And um, she was all things champagne and Paris and uh, cheap sunglasses and expensive perfume and just a character and uh, very generous and very giving. While she was going through treatment herself, she would bring me in gift cards and go, here, pass these out. I'm like, really? I can't use these? She's like, I'm good. Pass them out. And so um, she got through all her treatment and was, we thought, in remission. And then shortly after, it came back. And so she was diagnosed at 34. She passed away at 36 and left behind a husband and her 15-year-old daughter. And so when they announced it on social media, they just said, you know, in lieu of flowers or whatever, you please donate to the care project because my mom was heavily involved and she was very passionate about raising um, both male and female breast cancer awareness. And so there was so many donations that came in, I think over 7,000 wow. that we ended up starting a grant in, in Shannon's name. And so every year we give um, anywhere from 1500 to $3,500 um, to a, one patient, male or female, who's been diagnosed under the age of 40. And uh, we do that at our annual event. But, um, you know, it's she, I say, I'm looking at a picture of her right now in my office. I feel like I talk to her all the time, like she's gazoo on my shoulder, you know? Gotcha. Yeah. I'm like, you're not going to believe this, Shannon. And then something will happen. And I would get a random phone call. And they would say, you know, my friend Shannon Brown used to talk about you. I'm like, oh my gosh, really? And they have a $500 donation for me or whatever. It's just crazy. Carrie, she's looking down on you. She, it, I have the chills. Yeah, she yeah, is. Yeah. I know it. Do you have any uh, plans to expand your service area in Southern California? Well, not right now. I mean, right now what we do is, so our financial support, um, which again is, is minimal because it's all, we're donation based, you know, and then we right. do get some grants here or there, but nothing major. Um, and then fundraising events. And with COVID, we weren't able to have any events last year. So we have just gotten by the skin of our teeth. But we do provide, um, we're based in Riverside. So we service all of the Inland Empire of Southern California, mostly San Bernardino and Riverside uh, counties for financial support. But our global support reach is with our collaboration with lymphedivas for the compression sleeves. So any okay. patient that's managing lymphedema uh, in their arm or hand um, can get a sleeve gauntlet or glove or all three through the care project. And we actually ship those worldwide. Wow. 
Yeah. That's so great. my goal would be going forward, say we get through the rest of this pandemic and we're able to, you know, really expand on the financial. My goal would be, you know, right now, if a patient needs help paying their rent, maybe they're short 250 bucks, we can cover that. I would love to be able to say, you know what, you're having chemo for three months. We got your electric bill for three months. Instead of just keeping the lights on, we want to just don't worry about that for three months yeah. or pay your whole rent. And then if we get to that point, I would love to um, branch out and help others, but it's just, it's just me here. It's just me. And then I have one part-time assistant. She's the only one that gets a paycheck. And she was actually my first client. Well, you never know who's listening to this podcast. You know, this yeah. thing's going around the world. So yeah, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah. Tell us how the funds taken in and used. Uh, does a lot go to marketing or administration or how does that no. work? No, we don't. I wish. Um, so no, um, I pay Diana a very, very minimal uh, hourly wage. She works uh, 20 hours a week. And that is the only money that goes to payroll. Um, our board members all contribute monthly. And then we have care club members. And those are people everywhere that donate anywhere from $10 a month to I think our largest donor right now is two fifty dollars a month. Okay. And um, so we have rent and utilities and our phone bill um, and then Diana and then obviously our liability insurance. Past that, everything that's raised goes right back into the patient assistance for the financial stuff. And our, um, our survivor social clubs, we have one in English uh, the first Saturday, then we have a Spanish group on the third Saturday. Now we have a metastatic group on the fourth Saturday. Nothing happens with those that cost us money other than coffee, tea, and water. And so I'm always looking for local sponsors for that if they want to, you know, do lunch or whatever. And, and our community's been pretty good with that. You know, occasionally someone will step up and go, hey, let me buy you guys lunch. Yeah. You know? that's so great. really, uh, most of our most of our money goes there. Okay. So people who go to your website and see a donation, it's yeah. going it's going straight to the patients. Yeah. And you can choose too yeah. on our website, if you click donate, there's some drop down menus. So like if someone, some of Shannon's friends and past coworkers, they want to donate directly to fund her grant, they can yeah. choose the Shannon K. Brown grant. Yeah. Okay. Now, Carrie, you speak to high school and college age young adults. What do you convey to them? You know, I, I, back to that time that I spoke at UC Riverside, um, right before I got the email asking me to speak, I had my business mentor here in my office and he, we were talking about, you know, he's the businessman, like, how are we going to grow the care project? And what are we going to do? Rah, rah, rah. And I said, look, I want to keep it personal. If anything, I just want to expand, you know, like the amount of money we can help patients with and things like that. But what I want to do is be able to raise enough money so we could one day hire like an executive director to really grow the care project properly so that I can kind of step away and do some other things. And, you know, live my life because I've been working two jobs my whole life and I'm stinking tired. <laughs> and I said, you know, one thing I want to do is I kind of want to go talk to students, maybe like seniors in high school and college. And he goes, oh, you want to talk about breast cancer? And I said, oh, God, no, I'm, I'm sick and tired of <laughs> I'm talking about that. Right. I mean, that could be part of it. And he says, well, what do you want to talk about? I said, man, I have a story that I think many people can resonate with all the things that I alluded to earlier, the things that have happened to me and for me and around me that have created that narrative of I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I don't fit in. Who am I to do that, right? right? And then he says to me, oh my God, you could do that. You're a great storyteller. I'm like, get out of my office. <laughs> so he leaves, I turn in my chair, I swivel over here to my computer, I pull up my email and UC Riverside asked me to be a keynote speaker. And I was like, you got to be joking. Wow. This is not even funny, I'm not ready, God. And he was like, yes, you are, because you asked for it. So I went and I shared my story. I shared some of the things that had shaped me and conditioned me into believing I wasn't all those things. And the Amen Choir was there. They were like, oh my gosh, I get it. I mean, so many people resonate with that, right? Yeah, Whether you're sure. college educated or not. Oh, yeah. So I share very vulnerable, raw stories. It's not always comfortable to hear things that have happened to me growing up and, and young adulthood that have shaped my life and why I am so passionate about letting people know, like, you know what, you are worthy. You are good enough. You yes. are smart enough. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have. Some of the 
most titled people I know are big dummies. Let's just keep it real. Yeah. Yeah. They couldn't walk a day in my shoes, you know? And so we're all worthy. And I just think it's such an important message because there's so many kids and young adults that just don't know their worth. And the, the truth of the matter is you are worthy of all that simply because you're alive. Yeah. And so I share that. And then, you know, it's just about, you know, look like, look, this happened to me. This was said to me, this was left a mark on me, you know, but you know what, in spite of all those things, I got through it. And here I am today, you know, and yeah. they look at me like, wow. And some people say, well, you don't make a ton of money. No, I don't. But you know what, what I do is priceless. Absolutely. And so, yeah. Right. So, you oh, know, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's just, it doesn't, you know, yeah. So I share all those things. Okay. Well, what tips do you have for people going through the cancer journey, facing financial worries uh, due to, in some cases, uh, having assets and having problems getting help? I, I, yeah. I noticed this is going on in the Male Breast Cancer Coalition uh, that I'm an advocate for, as you know. Uh, we have guys out there that are having problems because they have assets. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you know about that? You know what? I, I, you know what? I don't know a lot about it, unfortunately. And that's, but it's the very reason that I started the care project, you know, here, we don't have a bunch of red tape to go through. Yes. I verify that someone's actually undergoing treatment and has been diagnosed, but we don't really go through that because here's the problem. While I was a single mom and struggling, I made too much money on paper to qualify for anything, right? right? Any assistance, yeah. even, you know, the, the other charities that were, you know, nationwide, I don't qualify for them, but I also don't make enough money to afford all this. Right. So that's why I did this was just to fill in the gaps. It wasn't to replace anybody else, but I would just say, you know, you've got to look all over. You've got to look nationwide. Don't get outside of your community because there are organizations out there that will help you nationwide regardless. It might only be a one-time thing, but that one time might get you through to the end of your treatment. You know, right. you just right. have to keep looking. Don't, don't ever stop. And I would say, talk to other people that are in your situation, you yeah. know, and there's the cancer legal resource. Um, I'm trying to remember their, what their website is. I'll get that to you. So maybe you could put it in the show notes. Yeah, but, I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, because yeah. there's there's a plethora of resources out there. Okay. You know, you just got to find them. Good tip. Yeah. Now, you've been a huge supporter of the Male Breast Cancer Coalition. Were you always aware of the fact that men could get breast cancer? And what prompted your support, which we are so glad to have from you? Yeah. So I grew up with three brothers. And then, like I mentioned, I have my dad and my stepdad, and uh, most of my best friends were male. And so the first thing I did after Googling, when I got my diagnosis, after I went to Google and, you know, checked out my survival statistics, which I wasn't supposed to do, the next question was, do men get breast cancer? Because I, I had one aunt that had been diagnosed before me, like stage zero, one of my dad's sister's. And then there was no one else in my life. It just me. And I thought, oh my gosh, is this genetic? Cause you know, back then I didn't know that most breast cancer is not genetic. Right. Right. So the first thing I don't have sisters to think of. Uh, the first thing I thought of was my brothers and uh, my son. And I thought, oh my gosh, can they get it? And the minute I saw that I was just floored because there is no marketing out there. And this was 2012 right. that talked about males getting breast cancer. There's so still had, not. So you had no idea. I had no idea. Okay. Yeah. I didn't even know that women age 40 could get it. You know what yeah. I mean? Because all yeah. you see is the commercials of the older white woman who's 70 with it. Right. And that's right. so not a, a good representation. And so, yeah, when we started the care project, that's the first thing I did in the mission statement was include male and female. And I had some people say to me, well, why do you have to even say that? I'm like, because people automatically default to female and it pisses me off. Yeah. This is not a, a gender specific disease at all. Right. Yeah. And then at some point, I don't know how I landed on, I found the, the male breast cancer coalition. I think when I was doing research about building our website and how can I best reach out to men and then, oh, there's a resource. Fantastic. Let me partner with them. Cause I don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's a bunch of you guys out there that are willing to mentor males that are, that are diagnosed. So let oh, me yeah. link up with them. And it was instant family when I met um, Peggy and Sherry and Brett and all of you guys now. So it's just natural for me. Great. 
we're, we're so glad to have you. Yeah. What prompted you to write your book, your new book, Handle with Care, and tell us what it's about? So actually, one of our social club members, uh, Margaret Lesh, is an accomplished author and a two-time survivor whose sister has also been diagnosed. So she's very familiar with the breast cancer world. And we would sit around here and talk about all the stupid shit that people would say to us, right? Like, oh, I remember when my aunt Peggy was diagnosed and she did this, this, and this, and she lived and then she died. And we were like, really? That's helpful. Why? And then just sitting around um, sharing tips and tricks about how to deal with chemo, how to deal with radiation burns, how to deal with um, not being sent home with a post mastectomy garment, right? Those types of things. So Margaret and I had teased the thought of, of doing a book for years. And then one day she came to me and just said, you know what? Steve and I, that's her husband. He's a graphic designer. We want to give back to the care project, but we got to get in college. We can't really do it monetarily, but how about we get together and we write a book and Steve will do the cover and he'll do the layout and a hundred percent of the proceeds will go back to the care project. It won't raise a lot of money. She's like, it's really hard to sell books. I'm like, okay. But the thought was let's in it. She's a court reporter too. So she uh -huh. interviewed to uh, 10, 11 other survivors, myself and 10 others, including Brett Miller. And we got their perspectives on various aspects of treatment and how to handle it and, and all the good stuff. And we just put it out there so that it's a real easy to digest. It's like a handbook. And it's not only great for newly diagnosed, it's good for people in treatment and it's good for the people that love them because you're going to get a real good perspective of what they really feel like when you say certain things to them <laughs> out of the kindness of your heart. And it doesn't hit us that way. And now you're going to understand why. Oh, so yeah. it, it was fantastic. She, I, Margaret is an angel. She did all the work. I wrote uh, some of it. She wrote most of it. Um, it was a lot of transcription, really. We used the, the, the survivor's words, word, word for word. So a book, not only for the patient, but also for the caregiver. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, my aunt, one of my aunts, who's uh, my mom's sister, who is my godmother, she loved the book so much. She went and bought like 10 or 20 copies. And I said, auntie, what are you doing? And she goes, I'm going to have this book in my trunk in case I run into anyone diagnosed or someone tells me that their sister was diagnosed or whatever. Right. She goes, I learned so much. And I so apologize for the things that I said. I'm like, you didn't know better. I didn't know better, you know? And so mission accomplished really. Yeah, it's a great book. Definitely. Yeah. Now, you now have a podcast, breast cancer and beyond. Can you tell us about that endeavor and what are the topics you discuss? Yeah, so it's called Handle with Care, Breast Cancer and Beyond. And the reason we did the breast cancer and beyond was twofold. One, people think, as you know, when you're done with active treatment, they think, oh, you're good now, right? You're good. You're back to normal. You're moving on with life. And truly, survivorship is often the hardest part. You're dealing with the anxiety, the PTSD, the scanxiety, the follow-up, all the stuff, all the things that go on. So it was meant to be a platform in, in part to discuss all those things and enlighten everybody and give patients going through it some help and, and perspective, if you will. But then also just to go beyond breast cancer. I think that a lot of different types of cancer, they can resonate with everything you and I have experienced as breast cancer patients, right? It's a right. lot of it is, it's all relative, right? Yeah. And so we do, I do talk to other breast, uh, I talk to breast cancer patients. I talk to caregivers. I talk to professionals. I talk to other cancer survivors, um, testicular cancer, young men. Um, for me, it's a lot about raising the male. The men's health issues are important to me. Um, and I think- in part, like I said, I have three brothers and a son. That's really important to me. And now I have all you guys. Um, but also, I'm just sort of wired to support the underdogs, if you will, and the underrepresented. And so for me, it's about um, giving them a platform to share their stories, how they coped, and just to, to just get it out there, you know, let people keep it real and keep it raw. And, and we do keep it real, you know? Yeah. And yeah. it, well, what you're doing is great. And, you know, we're, we're not getting that from, you know, the big pink organizations, right? you know, so it's, it's great to have, you know, guys like you out there. Yeah. What are, what are some of the common mistakes people make going through the cancer journey? The patients themselves? Yeah. I would say buying into that toxic positivity. 
Look, we all know that it's important to try to maintain a, a good attitude and a positive outlook and to be hopeful and to be faithful. And all of that is very important. But I found, and I'm going to speak from myself, the sure. biggest mistake I made was one I see all the time. And it's just trying to say, oh, yeah, I'm fine. I got this. I'm good. And not reaching out for help, whether it be emotionally, financially, physically, physically. You know, there was things like I lifted a box last week that I'm not still not supposed to lift heavy stuff. I lifted a box last week and I'm, I'm like in pain today, yeah. you know, because I didn't reach out for help. But when you're in treatment, it's so important that you just keep it real with the people around you. You know, I think yeah. that that's a big mistake is not letting people know exactly how you're feeling, because guess what? It's OK to not be OK. Yeah. And you can't a, do it alone. You can't do you, it alone. You cannot do it alone. You yeah. cannot. It almost cost me my life as, yeah. as a complication of surgery. You know, that's episode one of my podcast. But <laughs> yeah. but it's it was a real life lesson. You know, you got to ask for help. Yeah. What are you most excited about going for, forward with the CARE Project and your advocacy work? You know, I'm most excited, if I'm being real, of just still being here through COVID. I mean, talk about a heavy hit. I mean, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about um, having a, a bigger reach now with the podcast, with the book, um, with all our social media presence across multiple platforms, just getting the word out there. Because I think most importantly, look, if I had to fold tomorrow and never give financial support again, I would still continue to do my show at my own cost because I have received, and I'm sure you have as well, so many comments and so many private messages about how whatever it was you were speaking on that day or the guests that you had on just gave that person that glimmer of hope that they needed yeah. or that practical information, right? I mean, there's something so important about human connection. And I think that we all realize that throughout COVID, right? So I'm oh, really yeah. excited to keep working on the podcast and get it. We're in 44 countries now. So to just- I, I'm in 27 right now. Woohoo, we yeah. are doing it. We are it? doing it. Yeah. It's awesome, right? Yeah. Who knew? Yeah. Who yeah. knew anyone would want to listen to us talk about <laughs> what we talk about, right? Yeah. But it's, I'm really excited to continue to work with that. I'm excited about hopefully some big grant money coming in so that I can maybe hire one other part-time person to, to really do the day-to-day -day grind so I can kind of step away and take care of myself better, you know? Yeah. And I hope important. that we can, that's important. Yeah. I, my, because my you have to be healthy to, to help the other oh, people. My gosh. I know. I saw my primary care at 10 this morning. I saw my oncologist by video at three 40 and they both told me the same thing. Yeah. Slow down, yeah. you know? So, so I'm, I'm excited to hopefully raise enough money to, to really um, continue to grow our ability to help people in a, in a, in a much uh, grander scale and yet yeah. still keep it personal. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Carrie, how can people contact you? Uh, they can go to the website, thecareprojectinc.org, or they can find me on Instagram. Um, same, same handle, the Care Project Inc. is our company Instagram. My personal Instagram is TCP Founder. Uh, but okay. the carepojectinc.org, all you got to do is, is tap uh, contact us, and that will get an email right to me. Okay, I'm going to list uh, that link in the podcast notes and Perfect. any other pertinent links. It was a pleasure and an honor to have you on the podcast. Uh, this show features extraordinary people doing extraordinary things to enrich other people's lives, and you certainly uh, fall into that category. Uh, you are truly doing God's work, Carrie, and I applaud you for all you do. I wish you continue good health and good fortune. Uh, we appreciate any comments to help the podcast get better. Please email us at it's a wrap with rap at gmail.com. Our website is it's a wrap with rap.com. Our Facebook page is it's a wrap with rap. And thanks everyone for listening. Please stay safe. And for now, it's a wrap. <laughs>